Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to get started, and as people continue to come in, they'll be able to join in. Uh, my name is Michael Coleman, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Global Engagement here at the University. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you to this morning's U.S.-China Forum, which will focus on water and urban development. Uh, first, if I may, I'd like to say a few words uh, about the U.S.-China Forum. This is the second year of the U.S.-China Forum, which will go on over the course of the next three years, uh, which is an effort to bring together renowned experts from high-level engagements focused on issues of importance to both countries, the U.S. and China, and by extension, the world. Uh, it is intended to spur long-term research collaborations between Chinese and University of Chicago researchers. This year's forum is a multi-part event, having got started last week with a discussion on the broader U.S.-China relationship featuring Ambassador He Yafei, former Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China, and a conversation that followed with Evan Feigenbaum, who's the Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute, and as moderated by Rachel Bronson, who is with the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Now, the idea of the U.S.-China Forum builds on a long-standing university tradition of engagement with China that goes back over 100 years. Our faculty features some of the world's leading experts on Chinese traditional medicine, ancient Chinese texts, Chinese politics, and Chinese arts. They're engaged with collaborators in China working on issues of public health, childhood development, particle accelerators, energy and the environment, which we discussed in the forum last year, and now water. Students also participate in a wide range of activities based in China, including language study, civilization of broad programs, research, and internships. Today's event uh, and the annual U.S.-China Forum is the result of a collaboration between the University of Chicago and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation. I want to express my deepest gratitude to Mr. Tung Shi Hua and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation for their support and collaboration on the forum. I also want to thank Matt Terrell, who I'll introduce in a moment, and his team, Rovana, uh, Novia, and Sharon, who really have taken the lead on developing out today's program. Uh, I want to thank as well the Global Engagement uh, Office team, who has played a critical role in this, and our university events colleagues, Zernona and Aaron, uh, standing in the back of the room. Finally, of course, and most importantly, I want to thank all the speakers uh, who are here today and who are going to lead us through the discussions during the course of the day. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Matt Terrell. You have his bio on the program, so I'm not going to go into great depth, uh, but Matt is the Pritzker Director and Dean of the Faculty of the Institute for Molecular Engineering and the Deputy Lab Director for Science at Argonne. Since becoming IME's founding director in 2011, Matt has led the Institute on a course of rapid growth in the emerging discipline of molecular engineering. Under his leadership, the molecular engineering program has already attracted a core faculty of over 15, a number that will continue to grow with a thriving graduate program and a new undergraduate major. At Argonne, Matt is responsible for integrating the laboratory's research and development efforts and science and technolo technology capabilities. He develops and drives strategy on supported integrated teams across disciplines in support of Argonne's strategic initiatives. Matt's a pioneer researcher in the fields of biomolecular engineering and nanotechnology, and his work has provided new insight into polymer properties, especially surface phenomenon. He began his career at the University of Minnesota, moved next to Berkeley, followed by time at the University of California, Santa Barbara, before coming to the University of Chicago. Matt has received many honors, including the Polymer Physics Prize of the American Physical Society, an election to the National Academy of Engineering, and the Academy of Arts and Sciences. I look forward to today's discussions, but please now join me in welcoming Matt to the stage. Thanks very much, Michael, for a very excessively generous <laughs> introduction. Really glad to have you all here. This is the home of the Institute for Molecular Engineering, which we've occupied for about a year. Um, we launched uh, the University of Chicago's first ever engineering program in 2011 and have tried to, um, you know, come from behind by doing some distinctive things. It's not a total advantage to be starting your first ever engineering program in 2011 when there's lots of good engineering schools out there. But we've decided to do it by defining our own game, our own approach 
to doing this. Uh, first of all, molecular doesn't just mean we work on designing molecules, although some of us do. Um, we are talking about engineering from the molecular level up, uh, what a lot of people would call nanotechnology, small scale engineering. But at that scale, we cover the board from bioengineering to chemical engineering to electrical engineering and, and more. And it also is a statement of what is off the table for now. We're not building aerospace or civil engineering here and, and so on. So we're trying to create a program that sits right at the interface with fundamental science and is prepared to translate developments in chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, computation into new technologies uh, across the board. In that sense, we're not so disciplinary focused. We're not dividing ourselves into chemical, mechanical, electrical, but rather problem focused. And that's where today's topic comes up. So we are certainly interested in uh, uh, tackling problems in environment and sustainability, but also in healthcare, in information technology, uh, and in new materials development for a, for a wide range of applications. So that's, that's what's going on in this building <laughs> uh, when we're, we're not hosting interesting events like this. Uh, and water is really uh, very high on our agenda. Um, we will uh, announce in uh, a relatively short time uh, a, a new faculty appointment, uh, Professor James Skinner, coming to us from the University of Wisconsin to lead our water research initiative here. And uh, that will be followed by several more new hires. As, as uh, uh, Michael said, we're up to 15. Jim Skinner will make it 16 when he arrives here on January 1st. But then around him, we will build a cluster of people that will interact with the rest of our faculty uh, to create our, our water research initiative. Um, if you want to think about it, we're aiming to tackle nanotechnology problems in water purification, water purification, catalysis, and other elements where small-scale engineering can affect large-scale issues like, like water. So that's, that's uh, the, the basis of what we're doing here and, and why we are doing this. In addition, we uh, want to uh, have uh, important international relationships, and there's no more important international relationship than our relationship with China. And uh, we're really appreciative of the, the Chinese um, uh, speakers today who uh, represent a, a serious uh, a set of technical experience uh, that, that we can learn from but hopefully also interact with in, in favorable ways for them. I might point out that some of us, Sharon, Seth, me, were in Beijing three weeks ago, and we hosted a group of people at our Beijing center from across China, um, Zhejiang, Harbin, and places in between, <laughs> uh, to talk about similar issues. And we were very impressed with the, the ideas and uh, large-scale capabilities that uh, are, are available in China to address these things. So that's, uh, that's about us. Let's get on with what we're talking about today. We have four sessions uh, focusing on um, management and policy and uh, in the technological perspectives throughout the day, and then finishing with a closing talk by Christoph Beck from uh, uh, Nalco Eco Labs uh, that'll that'll close our day in, around the mid afternoon. So that's what you have coming. I'm now going to introduce Steve Close um, uh, briefly, you know, because we do all have extensive stuff written about us in the book, and, and you can read it. But as you'll see there, uh, Steve Close is um, a partner at True North that makes uh, investments in early stage technologies and uh, clean technologies that range from water to uh, waste recovery to agriculture and, and other things. Uh, he's, in that situation, he's really uh, required and uh, aims to be on top of technology trends. And I can say from personal experience and talking with him in different uh, uh, venues that, that he is. Um, he also plays an important role in Chicago as a chairman of the board of directors of a new organization called Current, which is part of World Business Chicago that aims to position Chicago as a uh, science and technology and business player 
in the, the water in water technology. Um, it doesn't say in in the biography that we wrote that uh, he also had a significant career in GE's water business before coming to his role in Chicago. So, Steve, I'm going to turn the podium over to you. <laughs> Um, yeah, and David and, and Jing, come on up. So yeah, I'm excited about this. So Tom Stanley here, he was my boss five years ago uh, at General Electric. Um, so I spent uh, time at GE, quite a bit of time in R&D, various R&D roles, including spending three and a half years in Shanghai, uh, setting up the uh, water R&D activities uh, for GE in, in China. So I've had the privilege of living both in Shanghai and then, of course, in Chicago now. And I was really looking forward to this, this forum to explore water issues really from an urban setting in these two beautiful cities that I absolutely love. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be in, an interesting discussion because there's a big conundrum about water. Everybody's talking about water and water issues <clears throat> and the need for more innovation in water. Um, but uh, it's also like, this, so we have these massive societal demands and needs in water. Um, but the pace of change sometimes feels like it's, it's a little bit slow and the need for new solutions, you know, which I think is part of the reason why here, you know, Matt is setting up this, this school here and with a heavy focus on water because these societal issues on water really are demanding new innovations and new solutions. But I think we can look at <clears throat> some hints of success in implementing new solutions and I think uh, responding to real challenges. And the, these challenges from in water are, are huge. You know, water, I, wa, there, energy and water are very similar in some ways, but very different. Um, you know, energy is, uh, is, it needs to be sort of generated. Water is kind of there. We're, it's not like we're doing chemical reactions um, and, uh, y, you know, generating water uh, as a way of getting water. We're not doing that. Water is there. We, we need to clean it up. So energy needs to be essentially kind of generated or captured. Uh, but water goes inside of us all as human beings. And most of us, I think all, all of us here, are mostly made up of water. And that water that we consume and we have inside of us is very important. And little bits of nasties in the water can do tremendous things. Look at rivers. I think we've all heard about lots of rivers where you've got pollutants that are coming from wastewater treatment plant that, uh, you know, these emerging contaminants that are not fully... Uh, digested in the way or removed in a wastewater treatment plant, they go to the river and boy fish in the river kind of turn into girl fish. And stuff like that is, um, it's just a little bit odd. And so you wonder, well, what about my water? What about these things? So we've got massive issues in water that are unique from energy. Energy, it's relatively easy to transmit energy through high voltage lines, as long as you can get them, you know, built uh, across, you know, states and interstate transmission rules are a little bit difficult and the policies for that. But water, pumping water thousands of miles is difficult. On China, try to do it with, you know, south to north water transfers, big ambitions. But generally, water is much more of a local issue than energy because it's not easily transportable. And something like California, something like 15 to 20 percent of their total energy bill in California as a state is pumping and moving around water. So we have these massive societal issues in water. Water really demands more local solutions than energy does, but water has got this thing about this health benefit, uh, this health effect that we have to be aware of. And I'm really excited here to have these two on the panel. So um, Jing, uh, Huang Jing, Huang, or Jing is, um, she, she's here, she is, she is with a famous design institute in China, and I don't know if you guys all understand how design institutes work in China, but design institutes are the ones that pretty much say what is going to be done from a technology and a design standpoint, so I know Tom, like in, you know, in GE, we, you know, we've got to work with those design institutes pretty early on if we want to get our products ultimately sold as part of a solution set. You can't wait later on in the process. You have to work with the design institute. And she is chief engineer with a big-time design institute in Shanghai, and she is responsible essentially for all things water, wastewater, and sludge related for that design institute. She's got over 25 years of experience. She's won numerous awards. She's extremely well-connected. And talking to her some, I can really tell she's got very broad mental bandwidth, you know, pulling in all the, you know, these various inputs from various stakeholders and various issues and processing them and balancing natural pragmatism with need for new solutions. And David St. Pierre here, I tell you, I don't think you can go anywhere in America and find a more innovative leader in a, in a water wastewater utility. I should be careful with Baird here. I'll leave it to, to a wastewater utility than David St. Pierre. Um, 
<laughs> so the, 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 the David's organization, MWRD, you could probably pretty much, you know, a lot of people could fill that role. But David, and you can go onto their website, and they've published these, these and you've just updated your goals, your like five-year goals, or I figure what they're, these, these goals. And they've got six or seven major initiatives, ex very ambitious initiatives that they've said, this is what we're going to go do. And they have made tremendous progress They've, they've, on, on um, marching towards initiatives around, you know, energy neutrality, I think by 2023. David runs the world's largest wastewater treatment plant. The Stickney plant processes around a billion gallons a day of wastewater. Dave, that's part of what David does here. He runs that plant. Several others provide safe water for all of Chicagoland. And has, you really, it's been fun to get to know you, Dave. So I think we're going to get into um, a discussion with these two fantastic leaders from these two cities that share a lot of commonalities, but, but some differences too, and try to I explore how they're dealing with um, the, the issues that they're facing and then how they look to innovation and policy as well. So um, maybe just start off too, and maybe we'll start with you, Jing. Um, if you could tell us a little bit, about, a little bit more about your organization and what, and what you guys do. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I'm glad to in, in, be invited here to Give, uh, talk with the experts about water challenge facing chi Chinese cities. Uh, my Chinese name is Huang Jing. Uh, uh, I work as a designer for nearly 22 uh, years, uh, focus on waste water treatment and uh, water supply and sludge. And uh, so I address myself, uh, a woman on the water side. <laughs> Uh, my institute uh, covered all the municipal design, bridge, road, horticulture, um, ar architecture, something like that. Uh, my job, uh, just uh, okay, Mr. Steven, uh, uh, also including nowadays is very popular in China. It's called Sponge City. Maybe uh, during the next discussion, I will give some detail introduction about it. Very good. Yes. David, do uh, you want to describe your organization, MWRD, what you guys do? Sure. So I was thinking, you know, we've been around since 1889. We were created in Chicago to solve a drinking water crisis because everybody was throwing all their waste into the river system. So we reversed the river. and. I was thinking, you know, to, to the United States, we're an old water company. To China, we probably are like an infant baby, right? <laughs> but but uh, that reversal, you know, we, we like to think at the district that we're responsible for Chicago being here in the first place because Chicago is really built around water. Uh, our organization has had many firsts in uh, this country uh, that, you know, that from uh, reversing the river to the first sewers that were put in Chicago, to the first interceptors, to the first treatment plants. And uh, before there was really a regulatory agency uh, CSO plan uh, that is extremely aggressive and still with the tunnel and the reservoirs that we've built mm -hmm. is visited from all over the world as a model for how to solve very large water problems. Uh, we are, again, refocusing on staying on that cutting edge and, and continuing in that tradition of innovation uh, here in Chicago. So may, maybe could I just ask like, like a little more color on, um, and, on who you serve um, and what do you think your performance metrics are that you're, you're held accountable to, you and your organization? So who do you, as a design institute, who are you serving and how are you guys measured? Yes. Um, in my views, uh, serve, serve as the end user, right? Yes, um, maybe design construction in one period, but the long cost, uh, long life cost, long running is very important. A stable safety. So, uh, for uh, in my t uh, institute, we also uh, focus on the new tech knowledge because I'm a designer should learn uh, many new methods and uh, to solve the uh, Chinese water problems. Um, and uh, in the design period, uh, we will discuss with employer, 
uh, and also uh, end user and maybe um, some uh, government officials, something like that. Yeah, so. for, for both, um, do you serve uh, industrial customers? Uh, uh, yeah. As well as municipal and government? Uh, most, mostly for municipal, Most because municipal. Is, uh, our institute is a municipal design institute. Now, uh, you know, some nowadays, it's uh, not individual, separate. For uh, domestic wastewater, also including industrial residues. Right. So uh, sometimes you, you can engage the one project, maybe the industrial wastewater uh, ratios Mm, um, and maybe m most of the um, ratios about uh, industrial waste. Yeah. Yes. N David, who, who does the MD MWRD serve, the district serve, and then how do you think your guys' performance is, is measured? Okay, so we, we serve Cook County predominantly, uh, 5 million people. I'd love to hear how many people do you touch in your utility? How many people do you serve? Uh, uh, my institute not focus on Shanghai, and also do the project uh, the domestic, yes. So in Shanghai, um, there is a... Um, 20 million? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so 20 million. Yeah, so I, I try, I, I want to feel small today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we serve 5 million people. Uh, we, we have seven <laughs> treatment plants we operate. We, we clean about 1.2 billion gallons of water a day. Um, and we're also in charge of stormwater mm -hmm. in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. And we took that on recently. So that's a significant challenge. Um, you know, how do we measure what we do? You know, we look at efficiency uh, across the scale, kind of on a national scale. What are our rates compared with utilities all over the country. Uh, the Chicago still maintains one of the lowest rates for this service in the country uh, because we've been historically so far ahead of the curve and the regulatory drivers haven't caught us where we've had to s scramble for a program, mm -hmm. which is very expensive. So being proactive uh, on those curves is a lot more affordable than uh, trying to catch up with those issues. Uh, and users are the way to measure your success. And with five million people, you have people that look at the world a lot differently. Yeah. Not all, you might not believe this, but not all of my five million people look at our service the same way <laughs> and want the same thing <laughs> from that service. So you really have to look at all of your constituents and say, well, you know, this part of my constituents would like this, and this part want this, and and you want to engage with those constituents, and then you have to balance that and do your best to deliver those services really to meet the needs of, yes, five million people. So David, we'll start with you and I'll ask a similar question to you, Jing. What are, what are the top of mind most pressing issues that you're facing and how are you addressing them? You know, so I would say there's three main issues from a federal perspective uh, and from uh, the U.S. perspective in the Midwest. Nutrients is absolutely the number mm -hmm. one issue. Uh, every, every state in the Midwest that's part of the Mississippi River Basin has been charged with the task of reducing nutrient loads by 45%. Uh, in a void of leadership, what that becomes is regulatory. And mm. r regulation uh, has unintended consequences. You can shut things down that are very important to uh, different sectors. So, you know, we're trying to take that leadership role and trying to figure out, well, how do we solve that problem mm -hmm. in Illinois so that we don't have those unintended consequences? Uh, and we're doing that in a number of ways in our plants, and we're doing that in a number of ways uh, outside of our plants, working with the farm community that we serve. And before you go into the other challenges, let me just jump in. And these nutrients, I think people know, are important because they go to the waterways, and they end up, for example, down in the Gulf of Mexico. You get um, these dead zones, and you get all sorts of problems. And just to point out how innovative these guys are, that you, you maybe just want to talk about your big solution here. I'm, 
you guys tested some startup's product, you liked it, you tested a bigger scale, and then you wrote a big, a big check to implement it full scale at the world's largest wastewater treatment plant. Right, so we, you know, we are looking at a resource recovery model for the industry, you know, and if we can, you know, phosphorus is being depleted in, in the mines that still exist uh, in the world. Right. Uh, we have to figure out how to recover phosphorus because we need phosphorus to grow plants, to grow food, right. to, to feed people. Uh, so we have invested in the largest uh, phosphorus recovery facility. Uh, we like to say in the world, in Chicago, that's important because we're just the third largest city, so we have to have the largest of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're recovering uh, 10,000 tons a year of uh, struvite, uh, which is a phosphorus magnesium uh, nutrient mix. Uh, and selling that. And selling that. As for, for, for a return on investment for yeah for fertilizer that doesn't run off into the waterway. And, and Dave, was that to meet requirements on nutrient, or was that to get ahead of the curve, like you're saying? It's to get ahead of the curve. So Illinois has not come up with nutrient standards in this state. Uh, so we volunteered for nutrient limits, and as part of our strategy, we implemented this recovery technology so that we could be, again, in the lead in our sector to encourage other utilities to do the same thing that had that capability to volunteer for limits and start working on this issue. Uh, we also, I'm not sure you know this, but we have 14,000 acres downstate. Uh, we farm 5,000 acres and we're using that as a uh, kind of an open public uh, best management demonstration for the farm community. Wow. Uh, and to look at technologies that can help deal with runoff in those situations. Okay, great. So that was one of the challenges, <laughs> the nutrients. The nutrients. Sorry about that. And, and then, you know. It's just a great story. You don't see the, too many uh, times utilities like this getting ahead of the curve. The second, uh, and really the first, that we deal with is flooding in Cook County. Mm. Um, we, if you're in water, yeah. you believe in climate change. Right? Yes. Uh, there is no question that you see weather pattern changes. You know, so I don't care what you call it, but we are getting more intense rains, shorter duration time periods, uh, or even, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had this 72 hour rain yeah. uh, that wasn't as intense, but produced uh, issues for this region. And this was a floodplain. Uh, in Chicago that we drain to this uh, created waterway system. Uh, so water causes us significant issues. Uh, we're looking for uh, unique solutions. Uh, we, we're coining a term at the district called outcome engineering. I, I loved hearing what you're doing here uh, because we have to start focusing on outcomes uh, and it should be multiple outcomes for everything we do, but flooding by far is our are, are one of the number one issues we struggle with. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks. Uh, Jing, is, uh, what are your, for your design institute, the top of mind issues or challenges that you're trying to address? Yeah, um, I think uh, Chinese has experienced a rapid urbanization and a sustained a high economy growth in the past uh, several decades, right? Yeah. Uh, over urban, urban by uh, yeah urban urbanizations and also um, brought on the environmental uh, challenge. So among them, there's uh, environment degradation, reduced water crisis, uh, similar flooding, and uh, salinization and uh, uh, water shortage and the pollutions also catch catchment the soil erosion and um, um, uh, eco systems something like this and all the diversity uh, biodiversity uh, diversity loss mm -hmm. and this is the um, most threat to the environmental challenge sure so uh, it's a uh, like um, uh, the urban Urbanization is a pressure problem, and this is uh, something a settlement pattern uh, um, in the global scale, yes, on the 20th centuries. So, um, you, you know, the uh, 2011 uh, in Beijing, and uh, fl a flash flood event uh, claimed uh, uh, 79 lives, 
and uh, also uh, in uh, direct eco uh, economy lo uh, losses is uh, um, RMB 11.64 billion uh, yuan, yes. Um, for this event, um, pre pre President Xi Jinping, yeah, Chinese President, so have quickly back to um, these issues. And so he called, um, called uh, to build the sponge cities. Sponge cities, uh, I think in, in USA, maybe the green infrastructure uh, sometimes in, uh, um, in Austria, I said uh, sensitive, sensitive, uh, um, sensi sensitive, um, sustainable uh, development systems, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I uh, we regard uh, this event as the fuse to development of sponge city. Uh, sponge city is uh, listen to the very like sponge, right? right? right. When the rings you should in infiltration, retention, and uh, uh, storage, purification, um, and uh, uh, utilization, then discharge. This is something like the spatial uh, equivalent. Uh, in China, uh, um, unfortunately, it's inconsistent with uh, the social economy uh, needs for water. Something as a spatial distribution is uh, inconsistent. So um, uh, the also um, just we talk about um, the Chicago's have good water quality and also Michigan Lake is a uh, mm -hmm. uh, Yes, capacity, the right. uh, large capacity. Uh, in China, the, the total volume of the refreshment resource uh, is on the average of uh, 28, 13 billion cubic meter per year. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, ranked the fifth in the world uh, behind uh, Russia, Canada, Indonesia. Um, but and the water resource endowment is low on a per, on a per capita basis. And uh, I gave the data about uh, uh, nowadays the water pollution and the water shortage, shortage is more and more often. It's so nearly uh, 634 rivers, lake reservoirs tested fill to the drinking uh, standard uh, for all and a part of the year. So uh, resource uh, management uh, and uh, waste water treatment coupled with um, pollution control policy. As a result, they are positively uh, to build and uh, to the water environment. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Um, Maybe just to follow up on that, I, I was wondering about this um, this idea of of, uh, of moving more towards localized and decentralized solutions, and wondering if you could comment on what you're seeing. And I know you did this uh, Wu Song project, um, okay. or you're doing that project, and other ideas about uh, you know there, there are two couple schools of thought. It's one large central infrastructure, which you know historically was built out. And now, with a lot of rapid, in places with a lot of rapid development, you're looking, really, how should that development go? In places like Africa, are they ever going to build out large central infrastructure? Is it, okay. is it the decentralized kind of just happening by default because that's the most practical means? So I'd like to hear from both of you, maybe Jane, to start with, and maybe okay. it relates to the sponge cities even, on, on more localized solutions versus large centralized solutions okay. for, for wastewater and stormwater, et cetera. A big topic. Uh, in, uh, in China, I think uh, different cities have their economy level according uh, and the capacity, and also uh, weather, climate, different uh, uh, characteristic. So in, in Shanghai, there is a combination. In the co center of the city, use the decentralized system. The suburbs, uh, uh, yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, for 
call center, you use the long distance conveyor pipe works to, uh, yes, m maybe the wastewater plant belong to the Yangtze River, is close to the river, yes, it's easy to discharge, right? And uh, so this is uh, for Wusong uh, wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it, the, the project is EPC by our institute. Uh, used the uh, process from Austria. Organica. Organica. Is the company, Organica. Yeah. Some uh, like the FCR, food chain reactor. Right. right? And uh, um, it's a uh, new the, um, planting. Uh, and uh, um, it's like a botanical yeah, yeah, garden. Botanical, yes, a garden. A yes. botanical, a wastewater treatment plant yeah. that you want to be in because it's almost like a park it's with these yes. gardens yeah. and flowers, no odor. Yes. It's a way of, of taking a wastewater treatment plant and it's it upgrades the value of the surrounding land as well. Like, who wants to be near a wastewater treatment plant? But that one you do. <laughs> but oh, sorry, David. The smell of money. <laughs> Wu Song um, plant just uh, the first uh, um, project used organic in Shanghai. Yes, um, this uh, on, uh, the capacity is so smaller. Yeah, the so forty thousand cubic meter per day. Forty thousand. So relatively meter. small. Uh, yes, I think it's small. Right. And uh, also, you, you know, organic uh, can get uh, the less footprint, right? Yes, um, to create the atmosphere for um, a local situation. Yes, it's small footprint. Yes, yeah, and also um, the project the discharge dis uh, standard not high standard now. Maybe yeah. uh, yes, uh, in the near future also use the upgrading upgrading because before approval, uh, the state council not uh, deliver the, the new standard for for right. it. Yes. Um, so, so you are seeing some. So, in in the in the sub in the surrounding areas, the suburbs, more decentralized solutions, yes. and maybe something like this approach of this botanical garden approach to a wastewater treatment plant that really fits a community. Yes, but uh, in my view, the Wu Song project also cut, uh, pay a lot of attraction. And to uh, uh, customers, yeah, many customers, uh, many customs, uh, also my customers, uh, so, yeah, interested. Well, that's good. <laughs> they, they listen, listen to sounds good, right? Yes, right. Uh, beautiful, the surrounding beautiful yeah. environment is. So, so, David, Chicago is built on large centralized infrastructure. Do you right. want to comment on any decentralized or things sure. like that? Sure, you know. So, I, I think it is uh, really location dependent. Depends on what you have in the ground already, you know. But where there's opportunities like that, I mean, it's just a beautiful site. I saw your slides on that, and, yes. and uh, if anybody can, you know, get those out to people to see, it's just a beautiful facility uh, that treats water. Portland is doing something very similar to that uh, with a high-quality treatment facility that is all natural um, uh, treatment. So it's just a beautiful site. People can walk some through it. The wetlands, it some exactly, right. And, and I think that as we explore you know, solutions to flooding, uh, we can create those types of zones. So you know, one thing that we're doing, uh, even in Chicago, is trying to develop that model where it's, you know, you're looking for multiple outcomes, not mm -hmm. just flooding. So we had engineers look at this problem in a particular yes. town in Cook County and of course they designed this wonderfully exactly square hole that could solve the problem and capture that water but we had an architectural firm look at it and they come up, came up with this wetland that's an amenity that restores ecology mm -hmm. that uh, also takes care of the flood water but yeah. also lifts up the community and the constituents yeah. and the economy of that town uh, and uh, uh, we believe will become a model on how to deal with you know, I'm, I want to coin the sponge uh, city term. I think that's a beautiful that's, term. That's, that's a beautiful term. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's highly dependent on the situation. You have to look at it. It's a, water is so localized, but it touches everything. And it's an opportunity to touch everything. 
uh, the more creative we can be. So, so, so let me uh, just uh, quickly ask about uh, implementing new ideas. Um, obviously, David, if you guys build a wastewater treatment plant, it makes a massive change and it doesn't work. It's a big problem, not just capital-wise, but it could be health and safety. So you do need to be naturally pragmatic, although to solve issues, you need to look at new solutions. So how does the district uh, evaluate, you know, test and implement, you know, new solutions? How do you, how do you guys go about that? So, as you might uh, carefully, <laughs> yeah. uh, carefully, uh, you know, there, there are proven solutions. You know, we're, we're uh, pretty traditional in the United States in our industry. We don't really like risk at all, uh, traditionally in our industry. Traditionally. Yeah. I'm not kind of, I don't. <laughs> you're I'm not, you're not a traditionalist, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I kind of like risk, uh, <laughs> but I like um, calculated risk. So there are technologies that have been around for a long time that we know work, and it's just a matter of applying them to our industry, and they haven't been applied before. Uh, I don't consider those large risks, so I'm willing to um, embrace those if they solve a particular problem that I need to solve rather rapidly. Uh, there are other things. We're, we're looking at algae processes right now. Uh, that will be able to remove nutrients from water and also deliver a return on investment. Um, we're looking at that from a much smaller scale, trying to build out, you know, mm -hmm. here's, here's what kind of hydraulic retention time do I need, you know, how much energy do I need to inject in LED lights uh, to cause that algae growth uh, that I can sustain and that can remove the nutrients from my process. And then, you know, I probably take, you know, the box that could fit, you know, on this stage and then try to design something that's a little bit larger. Sure. Uh, and, then, and then develop that into a process that can uh, uh, really utilize. I mean, algae is just a wonderful uh, component in, in terms of carbon uh, sequestration, yeah. uh, other issues that it can solve. Uh, it's just fabulous to look at these processes, but much slower. Sure. Uh, to to not take that. So, risk. Jing, how how do how do you, as a design institute, if you implement some new technologies and it doesn't work, that's really bad for the design institute. But if you have to look at new technologies to be a credible design institute, how does your design institute think about new innovations and implementing new innovations? Yes, uh, we also do the RD research. Yes, such. Um, if you um, take the project, maybe the some technical new innovations, maybe matched uh, simultaneously do the research work. It is sometimes you no regulation to yes. To, I think this is similar. So you want to get the research data to conduct the project. And also in China, uh, from feasibility study stage to mm -hmm. preliminary, the each part uh, to uh, evaluation, something like the assessment, yes. And the experts give the suggestion, maybe. Uh, uh, after that, uh, the mean meanwhile, do the EIA some, uh, and the, um, social stability analysis. So after that, can give the approval. So very structured yeah. process with many yes, uh, with experts. Yes, we should. I think yeah. this uh, program should be restricted. Yeah. So um, for the the for the final result can going well. Yeah. I, I think. So um, David and Jing, we've got an audience here. We're at the University of Chicago, one of the top institutes in the world. We've got a lot of researchers. We've got the best. Uh, technology organization in the uh, the industry in terms of you know yeah. creating innovating products and their research leader here Tom Stanley what requests would you have of the researchers here in this audience for you know innovation needs that you have problems to solve and therefore you know solutions for them to come up with is there some stuff that you would say look guys just get me this or can you come up with this or make this better what are your requests for the audience in terms of development what you need I, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my view, you know, uh, China, Shanghai is uh, open, guys. Right? I uh, did a cooperation with foreign, for, foreign, uh, foreign countries for more than 10 years. 
and also um, uh, good relationship with the uh, uh, USA company, uh, also GE membrane and uh, some and uh, Spencer uh, blower machine, something like that. So um, for me, uh, and also uh, it goes beyond just foreign. Uh, Deliver some some concept, uh, some situation about China. They also want to find uh, some um, new technical and uh, innovation thinking um, for the near future to cooperation and um, and uh, share uh, share uh, sharing the mutual uh, experience mm -hmm. uh, for me. Uh, Very good, David. Yeah, so I did have an opportunity to ask for a couple things earlier. Uh, From Tom, you yeah. got your list. <laughs> so, you know, so I, you know, I think that uh, again, and when we think of water, we have to th start thinking about multiple solutions. Uh, when we think about nutrients, and we think about the load coming from our farmland in the Midwest, uh, and and mainly from drain tiles, and we know that the farms have to increase production, and their goal is to double production to feed uh, a world that's increasing in population, uh, technology that can capture uh, that water from drain tiles and then take that nutrient-rich water uh, to stimulate crop growth uh, in, in a uh, cost-effective manner uh, would be wonderful, uh, inventing something like that. Uh, also, uh, technology that can accelerate groundwater infiltration Mm -hmm. uh, for the recharging of aquifers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have aquifers in every part of this globe uh, that are being depleted uh, for, for use of water supply. Yes. Uh, water continues to fall though, and if we can get that water back into the ground, uh, then we can recharge those aquifers and we can create uh, that sustainable Secret. recycle. Secret. So, so um, The sponge. So the sponge, yeah, create <laughs> a better sponge for sponge cities. Yes. Uh, I think those are, are two uh, issues that would benefit uh, Great. the world. Do we, do we have uh, questions from uh, the audience, some things on people's mind that they'd like to ask these great experts that we have here? We have one here, yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Tito, I come from Indonesia. Uh, I have a huge interest with the decentralized wastewater treatment plant and I would like to know this budget uh, to build and to maintain the decentralized water, wastewater treatment plant becomes a problem in China and how do you provide the budget to maintain and to build it? So where does the money come from for building out decentralized, localized wastewater treatment plant solutions? To and to maintain. So where does that money come from to Maintenance. To, to build and maintain these, these wastewater treatment plants? Uh, the wastewater botanical garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And for Wusong, this typical process, you, you know, the, the should put uh, the money to maintenance the plants, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, um, I, I, I know the, from the Shanghai SMSC municipal uh, sewage companies, there's uh, some maintenance fund to the each wastewater treatment plant to use. And also each year have the report, submit, uh, submit the uh, budget for the maintenance. Yeah, uh, and the money comes from the rate payers, really, uh, from, the, they from come, the charges. Uh, yes, money from the drainage so, fees. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the each, uh, each residents can pay. For the botanical wastewater plant that I saw pictures of, do you charge people to come and, and tour it? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, uh, do you have any revenue? That, it, I mean, it's beautiful. It is okay. beautiful. I, okay. I would, I would pay. But they're using that to get more sales. That is a good idea. Now I tell you, in Shanghai, there is an industrial tour now. Yeah? And David That's is saying you should charge them for uh, it. Let the people feel um, uh, how is the uh, treat, uh, wastewater treatment plant. It's, it's a benefit for them. So uh, <laughs> industrial tour, I think, is a for people's uh, many 
good youth may uh, know about the knowledge, know about their uh, distribute to uh, construction the plant because ERA and uh, social right. uh, stability. So, so I think the important point that is being made is, you know, if you listen to your constituents and your constituents find value in what you're doing, it's not hard to find the dollars to maintain and to take care of those systems. If your constituents don't find value in what you're doing, then you know it, it's very difficult to find those dollars. So it's important to tap into those multiple benefits and mm -hmm. to hit uh, the needs of the, you know a lot of different constituents that you serve, and then you have that that large scale support for what you do. Matt. Thank you. Uh, Steve, you introduced this. Uh, you introduced this interesting line of questioning how, how do new ideas get in? And uh, this is sort of a question for both you and uh, David. Um, uh, within current, we've been talking about a test bed for new water technologies right. that could attract companies that want to try something out. Right. Um, and um, I, I understand the objective, and I understand the term test bed, but I don't exactly know what what a test bed would have in it. What what uh, could you would you talk either of you talk about that and what you think a useful test bed to achieve the goals that we're talking about would consist of? So I can talk about my concept of it, and Steve might have a different concept, uh, but. One thing that I see that's lacking in our industry is a plant that technology that is not mature can get into mm -hmm. and have and and prove that technology benefit for the industry at some scale at the scale of a plant. Right. They can get into a lab right. and it's hard to convince a utility operator that hey, I've got this great thing that works in a test tube, would you like to put it in your plant? And, 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 and getting from there to there, so the test bed idea is I have seven plants, and I have seven plants at different sizes, at different scales, and I have processes that I need that I might put money in as a test bed. And, but also, if there are entrepreneurs that are looking for that stage uh, to prove a concept, I may not actually need that, but there's other partners within Current that would be willing to promote that. Um, I can supply that space. I can supply that world stage, any plant that's a test bed that can say, you know, and then we have the, the water world that comes here every other year currently that, Weftech. that can be on the tour and, uh, and, and entrepreneurs can show the value of that product in a real life scenario. And I'll just add, I think there's a, it's a stage appropriate type of test bedding that's done. So typically in, in a laboratory, in GE's laboratories, wherever they are, for example, in Shanghai or wherever, we develop, or de the company develops up technologies based on you know, laboratory situation. GE, for example, just to get a point of this, they have a, a, they've rented a spot in Burlington, Ontario, just near Toronto, uh, that, that they're, they're able to get real wastewater in, they rent that space, and they're testing technologies. Really on wastewater, you need to look at a whole year to go through all the seasons of that. And, and, that's the, and, and, and these can be small, small samples as well, and many of the samples. And you're doing structured experiments to see which, you know, which parameters and variables are most important, how can you get something to, and then from there, you come up with prototypes or larger scale uh, mock systems that you, then you want to go now to an MWRD and say, can you try this at some sort of a scale, first a modest scale and then a little bit larger scale. So it's really a stage appropriate. And we're thinking too of, I see Seth Snyder here and Seth Darling, who's both from Argonne and, and Mei Wu, for a lot of people from Argonne here. Well, Argonne can play a great role in this too because Argonne um, sits as, Argonne is a national lab, so they're very independent, they're well respected. They can test and, and, and they can validate. They can almost write a white paper saying that we've tested this technology under these performance conditions and it does such and such. And we in energy has that. You can go to the National Renewable Energy Lab and NRO will say this is how this solar panel works, this is how this fuel cell works, here's how it does. And, and in the water industry, it's sort of like when somebody comes up with a new product, you put your specs on it, the industry sort of believes it, sort of doesn't. If we could have Argon play a role, even in this whole test bedding thing, where they can look along the cycle and say, 
actually, this is how this thing actually performs, and you know, we validated it under this situation. How was it actually does this? So I think that test bedding network idea is a way of just pulling forward, helping things get through these stages, the appropriate amount of validation, providing opportunities for early stage companies as well as well, early stage technology, be it from General Electric, who's testing here at the O'Brien Wastewater Treatment Plant, their innovative MABR technology, or, or a young startup. It's, 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 put, it's figuring out how do you pull things through and then having the right stage-based um, uh, you know, testing for that. Right. Uh, other questions? Can, Steve, can I add one little thing? Yeah, on sure. That? Seth. So one of the big things, I've, I've interviewed about a dozen different states on, on basically permitting technologies, and they don't want to take directly vendor information. They want independent vo validation of the results. Right. Testbed network would basically provide permitters access to information that they could use to approve permits. And, that, and that's required. So if, if Dave wants to put a new technology in, he has to have the state say that that's OK. So it, it is a necessary step in the process. And I've heard that from, I've, I've interviewed permitters from about eight different regions of the country. So um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kind of have the next question here. I'll raise my hand. Yes, Steve. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, there, it just, just to twist things a little bit. Um, Urban city dwellers, who are the ratepayers uh, and constituents, urban city dwellers live in a concrete world in many ways, and they want to have a connection to nature. Water is a huge part of that. Chicago, we've got waterways here that in the past were kind of dirty, but now are actually becoming points of recreation and enjoyment for the public and a connection to nature. Shanghai is the Suzhou Creek, and uh, kind of nasty in the past, but much better now. And I think it'd be good to hear from you two how you see the role of water, uh, and maybe goes to your point, David, on these multiple points of value, how you see the, the, this thing about water and people's kind of emotional connection to nature in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a city life, and what you're doing about it. Yeah, so certainly uh, the constituents love connection with water, water's life. Uh, people love the sound of water if it's not raining too hard <laughs> or if it's not in their house. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but they, they do like uh, any, an ecology that uh, makes room for things that are green, uh, for things that also breathe, uh, that uh, were dispelled from cities. So the more that you can create those environments, the more support you get. I mean, those are things that traditionally utilities haven't thought about. We've thought about pipes in the ground and getting water and moving water. But you've done tremendous work and progress. You're putting UV in, on, on the water that goes to the... Oh, yeah. And, and, the, and the, you look at the Chicago River, you see people kayaking, enjoy it. We, the, the city built the big water, you know, the, 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 the walkway, what do you call that, the riverfront? Riverfront. The, yeah, so people are, yeah, the, the water is becoming an attraction. The, the rivers, not just Lake Michigan, are becoming right. that second waterfront. Uh, and people see the value because of the water quality. Uh, but we're also, I mean, one of my favorite programs, it's a program called Space to Grow, where we're taking schoolyards in Chicago and that are 100% asphalt, and we tear the asphalt out, and we create infiltration mm. under the asphalt, Sponge. new playgrounds, new uh, structures that become little oases in this urban, uh, communities and they and and they have the green infrastructure piece and the communities uh, where you wouldn't see a person on that asphalt you see people from all over the community coming in and enjoying that space okay so do you want to comment on in that? China there is a several regulation according to the water qualities uh, you mean uh, people uh, love water, yes, it's yeah. true, water is, uh, and the uh, circulation, right, uh, let the life circulation. So the, if you want to touch, touch the water, so this is the stricter um, standard, a uh, different, right. Some, sometimes the reduced water just for uh, road, road of, uh, washing, washing the vehicle, something like that. Um, and uh, nowadays, just uh, talk about the sponge city, right? Uh, if the rain is uh, ref uh, refreshing, retention, then used before uh, uh, in the draft weather, used uh, the uh, water to um, planting, planting, which, uh, uh, and uh, 
in Plunge Pong City, uh, I just talked about uh, six words, right? Six words, uh, it's mean like to take the six different measures according to the project. Uh, yeah, in the Sponge City area pilot, maybe used uh, several of the several of the six measures. Uh, uh, maybe uh, wetland and uh, gardening, and also green roof um, and the uh, um, reservoir, reservoir, uh, and also you use the public um, plaza. Uh, and uh, in draft days. They can dancing, walking, uh, yes, hiking, and uh, in the raining days, it's uh, like the reservoir to contain the uh, stormy water. So, yeah, and multifunctional. Okay. And we have time for another question. If uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mike McMahon. I'm up at the Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern University. Great. So while your neighbors up north, I guess. Um, I had uh, kind of three related questions. Um, when you're talking about developing new technologies, implementing new technologies, um, a lot of times you know you, you need extra money from somewhere. Um, so I'm curious right now how rates compare in Chicago for your average rate pair in Chicago versus Shanghai. Um, secondly, you know with these improvements you're talking about, if you think that a rate a rate increase will be a, a big part of some of these um, development projects. And then thirdly, um, how politically palatable uh, you think a rate increase might be in, in your respective um, cities. Would you like to go first? <laughs> or I, I can so go. It's a, so it, 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 it's an easy it, answer. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it's so, a <laughs> yeah, so the, you know, the, the innovation that we're investing in right now, we are investing a lot in resource recovery. And for all of those resource recovery projects, we're looking for a return on investment that actually would lessen that burden. Uh, we're looking at converting food to energy in a digester footprint that we already have. Uh, we're looking, uh, we've, we've got the phosphorus recovery that will expand to two other plants. Uh, we're looking for water reuse opportunities that won't generate a lot of um, uh, cash value. The algae process has potential to produce a lot of revenue. Uh, and our biosolids process uh, that we just got approved by the state of Illinois for a resale product, uh, has uh, significant potential for revenue. So all, all told, those resource recovery revenues uh, uh, have a potential between 70 million a year and 150 a million year return on investment. Now that's substantial, it's about, you know, 150 is about half of my operating cost uh, if, we can, if we can do that. So uh, people don't mind if I'm getting a return on that investment. Uh, and again, the other innovative uh, type projects, uh, we're always looking at the dollars, and I'm looking at, uh, because there's multiple six word yes. uh, opportunities, you pull in other partners that help you invest in those, that have those interests, and, you, and you're actually able to do more, and you satisfy more of the community, so you are providing that value. Uh, currently, uh, our, our average uh, uh, cost for service with stormwater and, and wastewater services is about $20 a month. But because of the economy of scale of the large customer uh, base that we have, we're able to do a lot more than most utilities. And so I think the, the, this paraphrase part of the answer is that uh, everything they do is to, it makes economic sense, has a payback, so it's cheaper. But your question too is like, where does that upfront capital come from? And I think you know they have stable rate bearers. Chicago itself doesn't always have the greatest credit abilities, but MWRD does, and so they can they have low cost of capital because uh, well, you got you guys have great credit ratings. Okay. And, and because of the state revolving fund, we we get cash right now at one point seven five percent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I also gave some yeah. Yeah, introduction. Maybe it can make sense. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, there are three bench uh, Sponge City pilots. Uh, the first, uh, first batch in 2015, uh, 60, uh, 16 cities listed. And the Chinese central government pledged billions of dollars in financial assistance. 
and also um, attracted the scientific research construction enterprise and then manufacturing um, cooperation financial effort be blended blended into and then win the one contract something like the PPP yeah, private public partnership so um, uh, each year um, um, pledges uh, a large amount of money uh, uh, in Sponge City build. So from 2015 to 2017, three batch. So, and uh, after the pilots get uh, the more uh, experience to build the f and further. Yeah. Nowadays in China, each city focus on the uh, city plan, including sponge part. Yeah. So, uh, in the past days, uh, uh, just uh, and the plan not including uh, sponge regulation uh, right. uh, at the same time. So uh, for attractor and uh, domestic assets to the sponge city, uh, sponge city construction. Um, one more words. Yeah. Uh, sponge city uh, is not like the sponge, just like the sponge city do the drainage system reservoir. There are also river restoration and the utility pipe, and also including it. Right. Uh, you know, this is a systematic, long term circulation, should compound. Right. Uh, I see. Well, this, this has been wonderful, folks. We're, we're out of time here. Um, I've enjoyed this a lot, listening to these guys. We're, we're, it's pretty special to be here at the University of Chicago, hosted by Matt, uh, have uh, experts in the audience, and then these two on stage, and hear what we did from them. I think it was great. We're, it, was, it was a fun time. Thank you very much. <clears throat>